In this video, we're going to introduce a new topic area, area of optimization. This idea of optimization is everywhere in engineering, of course. A simple example is optimizing the angle in a truss that will make it the strongest or resist the largest possible load. What's the fastest speed? What design gives us the most production? Anything that has the word most or least in it, least expensive, most productive, is an optimization problem. And we're going to look at the fundamentals of that that you'll see echoed throughout upper year courses and also throughout your career. To get started, let's consider single value functions, single input, single output, and just imagine the kinds of relationships we've seen. If we then look for the places where the relationship between the thing we control, x, and the output that we care about, y, actually let's call it f of x for here, where does it reach its optimum values? Well, it keeps going up and up and up and up, and then it starts going down, that is a peak there. There's also another peak here. So it seems like the points of interest, if we're trying to maximize, are points where the slope equals zero. Now it's important to note that that's not the only set of points. There's also a point here where the slope is zero as well. Maybe that's actually more interesting. Maybe we want the minimum cost if this is a cost function. All of these points have something in common that they have a slope of zero. But that's not the only thing that could happen. It's also possible for a function to stop for a brief instant and then go back down again. It's still continuous, but at this point here, we have what we call a cusp, where the slopes on one side are different from the slopes on the other. And at that point, there is no derivative defined. There is no individual slope at that transition point. But it can also be, as we see, the highest point relative to its neighbors. And you can try to draw other functions and look at where they have peaks, but I think you'll find, I hope you'll find, <laughs> historically we have found that these two conditions are what have to hold for a continuous function to reach a maximum. There's some fine print about open intervals and stuff like that. We can't include endpoints in this. Anywhere in the middle of a graph though, slope zero or a cusp. But it's important to realize that just identifying those points isn't quite enough to immediately identify the peaks and valleys of a function. It takes us a lot of the way there, absolutely. It really limits our search, but it's not the only thing. In terms of defining these traits, the slope equals zero or the slope is undefined where the function is defined, those are gonna be our major building blocks. But it's important to note that a lot of points on a graph with these characteristics are not necessarily either maxes or mins. For instance, if we even just consider the graph of y equals x cubed, it has a brief instant in the middle where f prime of x equals zero, but it's neither min nor max. And the same thing can happen at cusps. A function can be going up, pause for a brief second, and then maybe go faster up after that. f prime not defined. What we would like to be able to do, thinking about these points of interest, maxima and minima values, and these other points that look the same in terms of their algebra, the, the calculus of the derivative being zero or undefined, we would like to have some categorization system for these. Can we work just with the formulas and be able to identify whether this point is a max, a min, or neither? Absolutely. There's several tests that we can use for that, and defining and exploring how those tests are used is what's up next. Appropriately enough, our first test is the test of the first derivative, so the test of slopes. If we take a look at the shape we would expect to see with a local minimum, we would expect to see a critical point at the bottom of a minimum. If we had a local maximum, again with slope zero at some point on it, and neither a local max nor min could have a zero slope, and then something of that configuration, or possibly a zero slope but occurring in this way. And similarly, we could have a local minimum as a cusp or a local maximum as a cusp as well. In all of these scenarios, we can talk about the slope on the left-hand side as we come into the critical point. In particular here, if we're talking about a minimum, what we have is downward slopes or negative slopes. And so what we get for the slope of the derivative, f prime, on the left of c we get negative, and then as we come out of that minimum, we end up with positive slopes. 
that gives us an indication of what we might look for in the maxima. Notice the same kind of relationship, but reversed. When we're coming in, we see positive slopes. And then on the way out from the maximum, things are going down after the maximum, we end up with negative slopes. If we contrast that with our last two examples here, here we have positive slopes, then a brief instant of zero slope for our critical point, and then positive slopes again. And the last combination mixing and matching our signs would be negative slopes coming into the critical point, and then negative slopes again afterwards. What this gives us is now an ability to look at the first derivative around a critical point, and specifically just to the left and just to the right of it, and be able to classify the type of critical point without necessarily having the full graph in front of us. Applying that kind of information is called the first derivative test or a test based on the first derivative. Let's try to apply that understanding looking at a function, which is a nice cubic, and using that first derivative test to classify each of the critical points. So first, we need to find the critical points. And to accomplish that, we need f prime of x. Well, f prime of x will be 6x squared minus 18x from here, and then plus 12. We want to set that equal to 0 to find the critical points. And if that's the case, we start factoring because we have nice polynomials. And in particular here, we have everything with a six factor. And we just need an x in here. That's going to equal zero at a critical point. In general, this is the formula for slopes, and we want to know where the slopes are equal to zero. There are no points where the slope will be undefined here, so we can avoid that type of critical point. Because we have equaling zero, we can cancel out the six. And then we can simply factor as x minus 2, x minus 1. So that tells us that x equals 2. Take that back. So that tells us that x equals 2, or x equals 1, and x equals 1 are both critical points. For the original function f of x. All right. <sighs> to apply the first derivative test, what we can do is look at the first derivative, and we've got to be a little bit careful here. We could also write this first derivative in the factored form, x minus 2, x minus 1, still with the 6. So f prime of x can be written in a factored form. And then what we can build is a sign chart for f prime of x. We know that there's two points, x equals 1 and x equals 2, where f prime of x is equal to 0. Those are our critical points. And then we're interested in what happens in between. Again, there's different variations on how you present this. But if we're looking at the sign chart for f prime of x, we can talk about the sine of x minus 2. We can talk about the sine of x minus 1. We'll put those down a little bit lower. And then we'll have at the top the actual function f of x, which is 6x minus 2x minus 1 multiplied. All right, so let's take a look at the x minus 2s. When x is in this region here, below 1, we're going to have negative signs. In fact, when x is still less than 2, we're going to have x minus something that's... Uh, in fact, when x is less than 2, this is still going to be negative. And only when x gets past 2, like 2.5, 2.7, 3, then we're going to have positive values. Similarly, when x minus 1 is considered, we're going to have negative values down here. And when we have values just past 1, like 1 1.2, 1.4, we're going to flip that to be positive. And once we get past 2, it's going to stay positive as well. Numbers like 3, 4, 10 will give us positive values for this. And then 
being careful here, this is actually f prime, which is our slope formula. We can now summarize this. If we have two negative slopes or two negative factors in our slope rather, then we get positive overall. We have a mix of signs, we have negative overall, and two positive values in our product gives us positive overall. So what does this tell us about the two critical points we have? I find the easiest way to remember the first derivative test and how to apply it is to actually draw this, remembering that f prime is slopes. And so what we have is positive slopes and then a zero slope. On this interval, we have negative slopes. So this is a sketch of the original function, f of x. And then we have a zero slope. And on this interval, we have the positive slopes. And with that, we can read off from the first derivative that x equals one will be a local max. And x equals two will be a local minimum by the first derivative test. We've analyzed the slopes on either side of the critical points coming in from the left and going out from the right. And that together gives us a rough sense of the shape of the graph and in particular, how the critical point lies in relation to the points around it. Now, <clears throat> in this page, we're asked to determine the number of real solutions to the equation 2x cubed, et cetera, et cetera. Notice that this is f of x. This is our original function. Now, it's not at all clear immediately how this is going to be helpful or, the, or how the earlier work is going to be helpful. But think for a moment what we're being asked. We have the function. And what we want to know is, knowing it's a cubic, it could potentially look like this we are looking for the number of roots or zeros. We're looking for the number of points where this function value crosses the x-axis. And it could be that, or it could be something that goes like this. Well, how does the information from the last slide help us here? Well, let's take a look. We know the shape. We know in particular at x equals one and x equals two that the shape is going to be up and down but it could be here, it could be here, but that's gonna be enough to know because what we can do is evaluate the function at the critical points or find the y's at those critical points. Once we do that, we're going to be able to do a quite informative sketch of the graph and that's going to help us narrow down whether there's a crossing of the x-axis from this graph at different points, at one point, at three points, or some other alternative. All right, so the critical points were x equals one and x equals two, so let's find the value there. Just plugging in x equals one into this formula, there we get two minus nine plus 12 plus three, that equals eight. And similarly, if we plug two into this formula, we get two times eight is 16, minus nine times four is 36, plus 12 times two is 24, plus three, and that equals seven. All right, well that gives us enough information to sketch our graph. We know we have a local maximum at one, we know we have a local minimum at x equals two, and now we know the heights. And so regardless of the details, the overall shape of the function has to be this shape here. And in particular, there can only be one crossing, only one root or zero for our function, for our f of x. We know that because to cross down here would require having further slopes that are negative to get us past the axis here, but we already found out the only negative slopes occurred on this interval, and then the function was going positive afterwards. Going back to our last page, this sign chart told us that once we hit x equals two, the derivative will always be positive, and so our function has to be increasing from that point onwards. There's no way to go back and cross the axis. What this gives us then is a way to sketch a graph and use that sketch to answer interesting questions about the underlying function itself, not just 
what the max and min points are, but how this graph lies in relationship to the axes. Some students may also be familiar with another derivative test for critical points, ways to identify whether a critical point is a local maximum or minimum, and that is a second derivative test. Not too surprisingly, the first derivative test uses the first derivative, but it used it around the critical point. So in other words, we looked at what happens as we come in from one side and out the other. The second derivative test uses, not surprisingly, the second derivative, but in some sense it's a bit simpler because we just need to know the second derivative at a critical point. Imagine we have that kind of information that we have a critical point at some point C, so the slope is zero, and we're told that at that same point, the second derivative is larger than zero. Well, if you remember what that means, that means concave up. And so the graph would be shaped like this. And so that would tell us that we have a local minimum at that point. I don't actually remember these rules. I just do a quick sketch. The same thing applies if we know we have a critical point at the point C. And we're also told that the graph is concave down then from the shape, we must have a local maximum at that point. And then there's the ambiguous case. If it's not strictly positive or negative, the second derivative, then we really can't tell. We need more information. This is one of the downsides of the second derivative test is that it can be inconclusive. And that can happen from critical points like this, or even something simple like x to the power of 4, it has a local minimum at its critical point at the bottom, but when you do the calculations for the second derivative, you get a zero value. So it just means that you really should be looking at the first derivative test as an alternative when this test is inconclusive. Let's apply that in a quick example. Notice here we've been given some information about f prime of x, so we already have the derivative calculated. We're asked here to use the second derivative test to determine whether this function, the original function f, has a local maximum, minimum, or neither at the critical point at x equals zero. First of all, we should test whether x equals zero actually is a critical point. How would we know that? Well, f prime of zero is cos of zero plus two x, but x is zero minus one, and cos of zero is one as well. So we end up with zero so yes, at x equals zero, we have zero slope. So what we know about our graph is at x equals zero, there is some point with flat slope. We don't know where exactly it is because we don't have f, but we know the slope is horizontal. For the second derivative test, we just need to calculate the second derivative as a function first. We need f double prime of x, and here, we differentiate one more time. Differ the derivative of cosine is negative sine of the same thing. The derivative of the inside here gives us two x's. Then the derivative of that is two, and the derivative of negative one is just zero. At the point x equals zero, in other words, what happens at this individual location, this specific location? Are we concave down or are we concave up? Well, f double prime of zero is minus sine of zero times zero plus two. All that's zero, that's two. And so that tells us that f of zero is concave up. At that particular location, we have a shape that is concave up. And so x equals zero is a local, from the sketch, minimum for f of x. We don't know a lot about the function, but we do know that we have a critical point at x equals zero, and because of the second derivative test, we know that it'll be concave up there, and so we'll have a local minimum. And that's how we can apply the second derivative test. Whether we're given the first derivative or the original function, we just work our way down to the second derivative and evaluate it at each critical point.